Greetings to the Ephesians Bible Study family of Washera Community Church. This is your technically challenged pastor, Robert, who is coming to you now from the church website as we continue our Ephesians Bible Study together. Please know that all of you are dearly loved and dearly missed, and we pray according to God's holy will that this uh, crisis will be resolved uh, as soon as possible so we can be back together again face-to-face to study His Word. So if you found this link at the church website, I hope you've also found uh, the link to the outline that we're going to be using for this current study. Uh, You should be able to hopefully print that off or at least have it on your computer screen so that you can follow along also with this recording. The lesson title that I've given for our study now is The Incredible Saving Work of God, and this is part one The text that we're going to be studying the next three sessions, next three weeks, is Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. But we'll cover that in three parts. Next week will be part 2, and the week after that, part 3. So please be sure to have the outline in front of you, have your uh, favorite Bible translation in front of you, and maybe your uh, favorite cup of uh, coffee or tea or something else uh, as we study God's Word together. So uh, join me in the text. I'll read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and then we'll begin with prayer. Paul writes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for these words of Scripture that you gave to the Apostle Paul so long ago to speak to the Ephesian believers. And God, thank you that you are still speaking to us today through this precious word. I pray you grant us your Holy Spirit uh, so that our faith might be stirred and kindled afresh and anew as we study your word and listen to you. God, these are just strange and unusual times. We are separated now. We can't be together uh, in our church home But God, you unite us together with your written word. Thank you for that. Thank you that we can be together in your presence. And God, thank you that even by video chats and by phone calls, we can connect with one another so that we uh, continue to encourage and support each other. So, Father, we do thank you for this text. We pray your spirit would illumine it for us. Help us to see and to hear everything you have for us. In Christ's name we pray this. Amen. Okay, so let's start with an opening question. Why does something we can't see, like the coronavirus, make the world afraid? So if you'll pause uh, this recording at this moment, why don't you talk about that question with someone you might be with, Or perhaps call someone else from the Ephesians Bible Study family and talk with them about that. 
And as soon as you're done discussing that question, you can uh, hit the uh, play button again and we'll go back to the study. So the question again, why does something we can't see, like the coronavirus, make the world afraid? I trust you had some worthwhile discussion, either uh, thinking through that question yourself or by calling or contacting someone else to talk about that. Of course, you might have various answers to that, but boy, the whole world seems to be turned upside down. All of our uh, usual patterns of life have now changed by something we can't see. And I hope that'll be meaningful as, of course, we get into the text uh, and look at verse 1, where Paul describes transgressions and sins as things that we basically can't see except in behavior. And they, too, have something of a deadly consequence. Uh, like the coronavirus, I mean, people are dying, and our world is being radically changed by uh, this issue. So let's do some opening discussion about the 10 verses we read in this text and kind of get a handle on some of the key thoughts that Paul gives to us in this word. So as you're looking at your outline, uh, I direct your attention to the top of it where I've written a series of incredible contrasts. We're going to see three incredible contrasts that are built into this marvelous text. The first one, the first contrast is from being dead in verse 1 to being alive in verse 5. From dead to alive is the first incredible contrast we see in the text. The second incredible contrast is from God's wrath, which you'll find right at the end of verse 4. Then the contrast is with God's love, which is in the beginning of verse 4. The contrast from God's wrath or anger to God's love. And thirdly, we see a contrast from being controlled by evil forces in verses 2 and 3 to being made free to do good works at the end of our text that we're studying, and that's in verse 10. So a series of incredible contrasts. I hope that helps you get a little handle on uh, the exciting words that we have before us. And then in our opening, we're also going to look at a series of triads, three things that Paul intentionally groups together in the text that we're going to study. So I, I found four different triads or groupings of three things. The first one I'll call three controlling enemies. So as you look at verse 2, you'll find that Paul says there's a series of three controlling enemies. The world in verse 2, in verse two is number one. The devil, in verse 2, is the second. And our flesh, in verse 3, is the third. So the world, the devil, and our flesh are three controlling enemies, and then we call that a triad. Secondly, there are what I'm going to call three voices of our sinful flesh. And our translations are various here. So I'm going to first give you what the NIV had in their translations, and then I'm going to give you uh, some uh, Greek uh, words uh, that seem to translate, uh, I, I think, and communicate a little bit better. So in the NIV, the three voices of our flesh, first of all, in verse 3, called cravings. In verse 3, the second voice, desires. And then finally in verse 3, thoughts. So cravings, desires, and thoughts. Now, if I look at the Greek text, I, I see perhaps a little bit more specifically these three voices. The first one being desires, the second one being the will, and the third one being thoughts. So again, they're, they're overlapping, they're going to be equivalent, but check your translation for three voices of the flesh in verse 3. Then there's a third triad, which I call three redeeming attributes of God. In verse 4, his love. Again in verse 4, his mercy. And then in verse 5, his grace. Three redeeming attributes of God. His love, his mercy, and his grace. And finally, the fourth triad that we find in this text are three actions that God does in 
to procure my salvation. And those are three specific verbs we find beginning in verse 5, where God makes us alive. In verse 6, he raised us up. And in verse 6 also, he seated us with Christ. So three actions procuring my salvation. He makes me alive, he raises me up, and he seats me with Christ. So that concludes our series of triads. And again, I hope that helps you to get a handle on the wonderful text that we're going to be studying. So now take a look at your outline. We're beginning today in this study, uh, Roman numeral one, my former bondage. And we're going to only be studying verses one through three in this study. The next study will then commence with Roman numeral two and the study after that with Roman numeral three. So starting with Roman numeral one, my former bondage, we look first of all at letter A, the subjects of bondage. Who does Paul say are the subjects of bondage? He starts the text by saying, as for you. So he's referring to the Ephesian believers. Now, in the King James text, if you're using that for your study right now, you'll find next that uh, there are some words inserted. Um, He hath quickened. And the New King James inserts into verse 1, he has made alive. Now, that's interesting to me because those uh, verbs, he hath quickened or he made alive, that actually is found in verse 5. But the King James and the New King James didn't want to leave people reading this text in suspense. So they drew the verb from verse 5 and placed it already in verse 1 because they were concerned that people reading this text would kind of have the shock value uh, of learning I'm dead in my sins and I'm controlled by the world and Satan and my flesh and nothing seems to be solving that. So they inserted those words, but they are not in the Greek text of verse 1. So we look, first of all, at our spiritual condition before Christ. Paul says, you were dead. Notice the past tense. He's referring to our life before faith in Jesus Christ. You were dead. And this death he's speaking of is not physical death at this point. What Paul means, though, is that we're alienated from God, the one who gives us life. We're dead from the one who gives us life. We're separated from him, as other places in Scripture say, and we have a complete inability to please God in our spiritual state of death. So notice that dead people, in verse 2, live and walk and operate and function in the world. Typically, they don't know that they're dead before God or separated from him. In verse 2 and verse 3, these dead people think and choose and operate just like you and I do in this life. So at this point, thinking about that phrase, you were dead, it's not entirely helpful that we think of ourselves as a corpse at this point. Because, yes, corpses don't do anything. But this spiritual dead condition, people are living and walking and doing normal functions in the world. Going to work, going to the store, making choices and decisions, and yet we are dead spiritually before God. Paul has a parallel passage that expresses this same thing in Colossians 2.13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God, here's the primary verb coming in verse 5 of our text in Ephesians, God made you alive with Christ and he forgave us all of our sins. So back to our outline, we look at point number two, the cause of spiritual death. Paul says... You were dead in your transgressions and sins. Now, the ESV, the King James, the uh, New American, they will translate transgressions as trespasses. Now, we know that transgressions or trespasses is pretty much pictured by the signs that you see all over um, our county. Do not trespass. Folks post those signs uh, on their property and on trees of their property. 
To transgress or to trespass means to cross a line. It means any action that I do or fail to do against God's holy standard. And we know God's holy standard from verses like Matthew 5.48, where Jesus says, Be perfect, therefore, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So the scripture speaks and uses this word trespasses or transgressions frequently, both in the Old and New Testament. So in your outline again, we're going to look at passages now that use the word transgressions. And all of these passages, of course, indicate the gospel to us already. What will God do with our transgressions? So Psalm 32 verse 1, blessed is he whose transgressions are what? Forgiven. Whose sins are what? Covered. And Paul takes that verse and he uses it in Romans chapter 4 verse 7. How about Psalm 51 verses 1 and 2? Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Psalm 103 verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our, what? Our transgressions from us. Isaiah 43 25. I, even I, am he who, what? Blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Isaiah 53, 5, speaking about Jesus. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And lastly, Micah seven eighteen, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. Now we look at the second word that is the cause of our spiritual death. Transgressions was the first, and Paul uses in verse 1 the word sins. Now what are sins? What's the meaning of that in Scripture? Sins really is pictured best by uh, bow and arrow hunters, if you're out there today. To miss the mark is the picture of what a sin is against God. To miss the bullseye of God's holiness and His perfection. Anything shy of the bullseye then is a sin. So Isaiah 59 verse 2, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that God will not hear. Psalm 36 verse 4, even on his bed he plots evil. He commits himself to a sinful course and does not reject what is wrong. This is a picture of us before Christ saved us. James 1, 14 to 15 speaks about the birth process of sin in our lives. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Psalm 51, verse 5. We know that our sin is not just sinful actions that we do or fail to do. There the psalmist says, Surely I was sinful from when? He says, from birth. Sinful even from the time my mother conceived me. In other words, a sin condition is passed on to each one of us. Luke chapter 18, verse 13, one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. The tax collector um, and the Pharisee are both in the temple and are praying to God. But the tax collector stood up at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. How many people have sinned? Paul in the New Testament, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 7.18, Paul says, I know that nothing good lives in me, 
that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Again, Paul in Romans 8, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Now, the New Testament and the Old both, of course, speak of what God does because of our sins. So these are all good news passages I've drawn from the New Testament that use this same word as Paul used in Ephesians 2 verse 1, that we're dead in our transgressions and sins. So here's the good news, Matthew 1 21. The angel speaks to Joseph in a dream and says about Mary, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. John 1, 29, John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul in 1 Timothy 1, 15, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Now, the gospel in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. And John again in 1 John 2, verse 2, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And finally, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, my uh, last passage using the word sin, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. There's the good news in Jesus Christ. So now I encourage you to pause the recording at this point and find on your outline discussion questions number one. If you've printed that, it should be on the back side of your outline. There are six questions there, so I encourage you to process those six questions, either if you're by yourself, call one of the Ephesians Bible Study family members, perhaps you're with someone else in your house, Bring those questions up and talk about that in order to review the scripture that we've just covered. And when you've finished uh, processing those questions, go ahead and hit play again and we'll continue with the study. Welcome back to our Ephesians Bible study of Ephesians chapter 2. Our title is The Incredible Saving Work of God. And previously, we just covered uh, my former bondage and the subjects of bondage as Paul was teaching that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. So letter A, we've already covered the subjects of bondage. Let's look at our outline at letter B, the controlling enemies, those enemies of us before Christ that have kept us in bondage. So again, looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writes, as we continue then in verse 2, in which you used to live. So as for you, verse 1, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Verse 2, in which you used to live. Now, notice that even the words transgressions and sins in verse 1 are not just meant to be some kind of theological scare words to control people. Paul now says in verse 2, see, we live in that kind of condition. We operate in the world before a relationship with Jesus Christ in transgressions, in sins. That's the condition of our life which separates us from God. So this word in which you used to live really is an important word. And this is what we're going to call a bookend. Our Ephesians Bible study family knows about those where we see this word used to live here in verse 2, we find the other bookend at the end of verse 10 in which you used to walk in them in some of your translations or uh, the works that God prepared for us to do was the shorter translation in the NIV. 
So here at the beginning of verse 2, in which you used to live, and then at the very end of verse 10, good works in which you live or walk. So those verbs in verse 2 and verse 10 form a bookend of this entire text for us. It encloses this text as being the portion that we're going to study together. So Paul, uh, NIV translating, you used to live, ESV, King James, and the NIS uh, translate, in which you used to walk. In other words, he's talking about our conduct of life, how we live and walk and the things we do and say in the world is the issue that Paul is addressing. We're thankful, of course, for the adverb of time, used to. In other words, he again is describing our life before a saving relationship with Jesus. You once walked this way. You used to walk this way. Now, th that verb again, as interesting as it is, you used to live or you used to walk. We know it's a bookend word with verse 10. It's also interesting that Paul uses this verb, you walk or you, how you live. He uses it seven times in the book of Ephesians. So I'm going to just quickly give you the references to the seven times Paul uses this verb, and you can study this then throughout the whole epistle at your own leisure. So, of course, right here in verse 2, Paul describes then the first of seven walks, which I'm going to call the old walk. The second walk is in verse uh, 10 of uh, chapter 2, which we've already mentioned then. We're going to call that the present walk. The third walk is called the worthy walk, and that's found in chapter 4, verse 1. The fourth walk is called the foolish walk, and that's found in chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. The fifth walk is called the walk in love, which is found in chapter 5, verse 2. The sixth walk is called the walk in light, which is found in chapter 5, verse 8. And finally, the seventh walk, the careful walk, which is found in chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. Now, the good thing about uh, pre-recorded Bible studies is if you missed any of those references or walks, you can now stop the recording and reverse and find them again. But we'll continue then. So, transgressions and sins, Paul says, are compelling forces in life that affect everybody in their everyday behavior and choices. So, I just picked one passage from the Old Testament, Leviticus 18, verse 3, where there it's written, you must not do as they do in Egypt. So, the Israelites were not supposed to live and behave as the Egyptians. The verse goes on to say, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you. Do not follow their practices. So we are to live according to God's will and word. We are not to live according to our sinful desires in our flesh. Now, the New Testament, Paul speaks very much the same way. Romans 12, verse 2, you might have already been thinking of that passage. Paul says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. We are to break our patterns of living and connection with the world which is sinful and which is against God. Now, as Paul goes on in verse 2, we're now going to look at the three controlling enemies that affect everybody before a relationship with Christ. So, number one, the first controlling enemy is the world. Paul writes in verse 2, when you follow the ways of this world. ESV, KJV, and NAS translate when you follow the course of this world. So this is the first of three spiritual bondages that everybody before Christ is subject to. So if you live in the world, and I think right now that applies to every one of us, then the world has a power of its own to keep people in bondage to it. We often speak about the pull of the world, and it's universal. Everybody before Christ is under the power of the world. 
Now, what do we mean by this term world? What does Paul mean by that? Of course, much more than just the globe that you might see on a teacher's desk. The world, the term he uses here, then is a picture of every non-Christian belief or religion. All of that is a picture of the world. We also understand from this term, the world refers to any Christless value system. Any value, any belief that is Christless then is a part of the power of the world. We might also speak of the world as being the pressure that we get from sometimes one another or from peers, from co-workers or our neighbors. That's a part of the power of the world, the pressure to not live a godly life, the pressure to do things which are sinful and wrong. Or we could speak of the world as being indulgence of material things, the consumption of things. Perhaps advertising might represent the power of the world or TV programs which are Christless. So, of course, the scripture speaks to us clearly about remaining separate from the world even though we live in it. So, Paul in Galatians 1 verse 4 says that Christ gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. There's a sin in this world in which we live, which Christ died to rescue us from. 1 John 5, 19. John says, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. The Old Testament spoke the same way. Isaiah 13, verse 11, I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. But now we look at passages in the New Testament, of course, using uh, the, the, the word world that Paul uses here. But of course, we already find out the good news of what Christ will do for us. Matthew 5.14, Jesus says, you are the light of the, the world, you see? So that light of Christ in us is what overcomes the power and the pull of the world. Again, John 1.29, we covered this in uh, the previous section of the outline. John says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 3.16, our favorite gospel passage for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. And moving on to John 3.17, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So there, uh, John used the same term world three times in that verse. John 17.15, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. 1 John 2.15 Do not love the world or anything in the world. So this is John's warning even now to us who are believers. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And 1 John 2.17 Another warning for us. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So the first controlling enemy that is against us, Paul says, is the world. Let's look at the second controlling enemy. Paul says in verse 2, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and, here's the second controlling enemy, of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Now who is that? His common name, of course, is the devil or Satan, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. So Paul uses a unique term here. Um, ESV, King James, and the New American translate the term ruler as prince. So this word ruler or prince is the second of three uh, triad then of spiritual bondage. The world and the devil have a hold on everybody in the world. Now, this term ruler or prince is the same term that Paul used in chapter 1, verse 21, referring to demonic beings. You can go back to uh, chapter 1, verse 21 to review that verse. 
in the Old Testament, those of you who have studied uh, the prophetic sections of the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 10, verses 13 and 20, the term prince appears there also as demonic uh, rulers or princes or uh, demonic beings. We're very familiar then with John 8, 44 in the New Testament, where Jesus says, uh, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. In the Old Testament, of course, we know that Satan appeared in the garden to Eve and then to Adam as what? As the serpent. In Isaiah 14 and in Ezekiel 28, uh, the references in your outline, Satan is referred to as a morning star and a guardian cherub. He was one of God's created angels who rebelled against God and then was kicked out of heaven along with uh, other angelic beings who also fell and he took with him. Luke chapter 10 verse 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan, his common name, uh, or devil in the New Testament, fall like lightning from heaven. So this is the second controlling force in the world. The world has a pull, and Satan himself is active in the world. So we're going to look at what Paul describes about him. So the ruler of the kingdom, let's pause there. The ruler of the kingdom um, ESV, uh, King James, and NES, again, translate that, ruler of the power of the air, if you have that in your translation. So, in other words, Satan's domain, his kingdom, or his power, his domain, is on earth. He has a kingdom, John 12, 31. Now is the time for judgment on this world, Jesus says. Now the prince of this world, a reference to Satan, will be driven out. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4. the God of this age, a reference to Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 1 John 4.4, 4. you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you, the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ, is greater than than the one who is in the world, a reference to Satan. 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So now letter B, where is the location of Satan's kingdom or his power? Paul writes, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. All translations translate that the same way. The location of his kingdom is the kingdom of the air. This is the only verse in the Bible that speaks about the air as the domain of Satan. But this was a familiar Jewish concept. Air being used then here by Paul as a metaphor for the spirit world, as of course demons are invisible just as the air. So let us see, what is Satan's occupation in this kingdom where he operates. He is, verse 2, the spirit who is now at work. Paul says he is presently working against all people. Unbelievers are under his control, and of course believers by Jesus Christ know how to defeat him. But Paul uses another adverb of time. He is now at work. He's presently working. And the verb is in uh, present tense. It's an ongoing acti activity of Satan to be working against people in this world. So we're very familiar with uh, Peter's words in 1 Peter 5 eight. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a what? A roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And for believers who have Christ within them, Peter goes on to remind us, resist him and he will flee from you. That's the power of Christ in us. Letter D, what is Satan's target audience? Paul uh, goes on in verse 2 to say, 
the Spirit who is now at work in what audience? In those who are disobedient. So, um, here we see, of course, Satan directly is targeting the disobedient, those who are indulging in sin and transgressions, those who are willing to follow the ways of Satan. So, six times this word, those who are disobedient, that word disobedient used six times in the New Testament, and the disobedience is always in reference to God. So, Paul uses again the term in Ephesians 5 or 6, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Letter E of your outline, who are Satan's universal subjects? Paul says now, as we begin verse 3, all of us also lived among them. Let's stop there. All of us. Now, Paul includes himself while he's speaking to the Ephesian believers, and of course, by application, were included as well too. All of us were under the power and control of the world, and secondly, the devil. Or the King James translates this verb uniquely, we had our conversation with him, or we conducted ourselves in the ways of the world. So here Paul uses the verb lived then as a metaphor again for our conduct. All of us lived among them, the disobedient, at one point. Letter F then, the timing of Satan's control at one time. We all lived among them at one time. This is speaking then about our pre uh, life before Jesus Christ, who we were before Christ came and rescued us. So, two controlling elements we've covered. The first, the world. The second is Satan. And now we go on to look at the third controlling element, the, the third member of the triad of controlling elements, uh, elements, and that's the flesh. So, the world, the devil, and our flesh keeps us in spiritual bondage, and so that triad now we see is complete. So, the, the sinful flesh with which we're born, and by nature which we inherited from our parents and from Adam and Eve, our sinful flesh, Paul says, has an overwhelming influence that orders and controls our lives before Jesus Christ. Now, we know really clearly, those of us who have studied in the New Testament, that the Christian life, when we are in Christ, still has an ongoing conflict between the flesh and the Holy Spirit, which lives within us. The battle rages on, even for believers. So, Paul, in Romans 7, 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate... I do. And again in Romans 7, 18. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out because of my sinful flesh. So now in verse 3, uh, Paul personifies the flesh as having three unique voices that speak in our life. So this is another triad. So the flesh itself has three unique voices that speak into our lives before Christ. And, of course, we wrestle with those voices now, even after being saved. The first voice is called, and I'm going to give you uh, the Greek terms uh, for here, uh, here first. Uh, don't forget, these terms are a little bit overlapping in all of our translations. So, the first voice of our sinful flesh from the Greek is called uh, its desires. The NIV translates the word cravings of the sinful flesh. The uh, English uh, Standard Version, ESV, translate passions of our sinful flesh. And the King James and the New American translates the lusts of our sinful flesh. So, this is the first voice of our sinful flesh. Now, the term desires, or passions, or cravings, really is a neutral term. Uh, passions and cravings can either be positive or negative. They can be either good or evil. 
And because, of course, we're speaking about that which controls sinful flesh, these desires then are evil, as Paul uses this term in this verse. Um, The term is used also in Mark 4, verse 19, a reference in your outline. But the worries of this life, Jesus says, and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. That's in the parable of the sower and the seed. Jesus, in John 8, 44, uh, speaking to the Jewish religious uh, leaders, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. That's the word Paul uses in our text here in Ephesians 2, 3. Romans 13, 14, Paul uses the same term. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature, or in other translations, the lust of the flesh. So the first voice of the sinful flesh is desires. The second voice of the sinful flesh is its will. So its will, and you may then have the term here, desires, which again I say in your Bible text, these will overlap. But the sinful flesh has desires for evil. The sinful flesh has a will for evil. It wants to choose evil. So this is, I think, best reflected in Genesis 6 verse 5 when God assessed humanity before the flood. And then the text says, every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The sinful flesh has a will. It wants to do sinful things. And thirdly, the third triad word of the sinful flesh is thoughts. It has thoughts. So the cravings of the sinful flesh in the text, following its desires and now thoughts. Here's the third uh, word then of the triad, voices of the sinful flesh. The sinful flesh has a mind of its own, in other words, right? It has thoughts. It can think. But its thinking, we find out in Ephesians 4.18, is darkened. Paul says, you are darkened in your understanding. And this is when we understand then in Matthew 22.37, where Jesus says that we are to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind. So this is the problem. We can't do that because the voice of our sinful flesh darkens our mind and our understanding of what God desires and expects of us. Also, a parallel passage in Colossians 1.21. Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. So now we've completed that part of this verse, the triad of the voices of our sinful flesh. So that the sinful flesh has desires, the sinful flesh has a will, and the sinful flesh has thoughts. So now I encourage you to pause uh, the recording and look for discussion questions number two on the back side of your outline or the second sheet of your outline. Take some time to think through and answer the discussions that are there. Call someone else from the Ephesians Bible study. Email or text somebody and get into a conversation so that we can process this part of the study. And then when you're ready, hit play and we'll continue. Welcome back. So far we've covered in our study of Ephesians 2 the subjects of bondage. That was letter A. We've also then just covered the controlling enemies who keep us into bondage. In verses 2 and 3, we see that the world and Satan and our sinful flesh are a triad of controlling enemies. And uh, then we covered in verse 3 that the sinful flesh itself has a triad within it. The sinful flesh has three voices that continually speak to us and those voices um, were the, uh, the desires of the flesh, uh, 
the will of the flesh and the thoughts of the flesh. So we've covered that in the uh, previous uh, part of our study. And now if you find in your outline, we're moving to letter C, the outcome of bondage. Where does all of this lead? Uh, the, that the fact that before Christ we're in spiritual bondage and that there are powerful forces in the world that are against us, which keep us from a life with God. Let us see, what is the outcome of all of this? Where does this lead to? So we look at a couple of points, and then our study here of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 will be completed. So in your outline, let us see the outcome of bondage. Number one, our universal dilemma. So, again, reading in verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Now, we pick up the new uh, part of verse 3. Like the rest, Paul says, here's our universal dilemma. Everybody is in the same sinking ship. In this world, everybody, including Paul, he includes himself, he includes the Ephesian believers, everybody born into this world is in the universal dilemma. Like the rest, he goes on, number two in your outline, our universal nature. We were by nature objects of wrath. Paul says, all of us have something in common. And not just that we're all staying at home these days and fearing the coronavirus. Before Christ, we all have something in common. It's called our sinful nature. This human nature, which everybody has and is born with, at its best, without Christ, means we are objects of wrath. Paul includes himself and the Ephesians believers, as well as us today, before our life in Christ, we're in the same ship by nature, by uh, inheriting a sinful flesh. We're in the same condition as Adam and Eve. And when people use the expression, I want to do what comes naturally to me. I mean, it's my choice. It's my decision. I can do whatever I want, whatever is natural for me. Sadly, according to Paul's words in this verse, that sinful nature by doing what comes naturally to us is going to lead to destruction and separation from God. Number three, our universal outcome. So like the rest, all of us were by nature objects of wrath. Here's the universal outcome for everybody in the world apart from Jesus Christ. The Greek text literally says that we are children of wrath, and that's the translation found in the ESV, uh, KJV, and the NAS, that we are children of wrath. In other words, God's anger is a manifestation of his holiness and his righteousness, and that anger then is... Uh, is directed against all who are sinful. So the consequence of our sin, of our sin nature and the sin that we live in and do, inherits and deserves the wrath of God. It means that we will be separated from God forever. So this term, the wrath of God, of course, is not a pleasant teaching or concept, but we find it used uh, throughout the Old and New Testament. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Paul there says that God's wrath is present. In other words, it is operative in the world against those who defy his holiness and his righteousness. In 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, there Paul says that God's wrath is future. God will bring judgment against the world at the second coming of Christ, and his wrath will be uh, levied against those who have not repented and believed. In John 3.36, Jesus himself says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. The Old Testament as well spoke of the wrath of God in this way. Isaiah 34 verse 2. The Lord is angry with all nations. His wrath is upon all their enemies. 
their armies, excuse me. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. And then uniquely, I turn to Revelation chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, the last book of the New Testament, where after the uh, first series of judgments during the time of the tribulation, the seal of judgments, uh, the unbelievers of the world uh, say this, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? So even in the tribulation, the unbelieving of the world will know and recognize the wrath and anger of God against a sinful world. So how much more so is it imperative for us to come in humble repentance and faith to Jesus Christ and to trust Him alone as Savior and Lord, that we might be rescued from the coming wrath? So that's the brief section, letter C on your outline, the outcome of bondage. Paul says, all people by nature are deserving or are objects of God's wrath. That's because of our sin and our trespasses in which we are in a condition against the righteousness and holiness of God. So now pause the recording uh, one last time. And look for discussion questions number three on your outline. Take some time to process um, this brief part of verse three that we've just studied. And then when you're ready to continue, go ahead and hit play again. Okay, we've just covered um, the first part of our study of Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 10. Uh, Today we covered Roman uh, numeral 1, my former bondage. And we looked at letter A, the subjects of bondage. We looked at letter B, the controlling enemies that keep us in bondage. And we've looked at letter C, the outcome of bondage. So uh, you might understand now uh, why the King James and New King James uh, imported the precious uh, verb from verse 5 that God makes us alive. And they imported it and put it into verse 1 of our text because alone verses 1, 2, and 3 do not have any good news for us. Uh, So when we get together next time, we're going to continue with our study then, beginning in verse 4. We'll go through verse uh, 4 through 7. And of course, there the good news of the incredible saving work of God. We'll look at part two, the next part of his incredible saving work, and enjoy the gospel in its fullest. The work of God on our behalf through Jesus Christ. So would you join me in prayer, please? Father, we thank you for this time that we've been able to uh, sit before you at your throne and to hear you speak to our hearts and our lives. Lord, we know that apart from grace in your son, Jesus Christ, we are a lost people. We, we live in our transgressions and our sins, and that's our daily life, and God, we're just stuck And there's no way for us to get out of those concrete boots that we're in. So, God, we are grateful for the news of the gospel, the great news of your incredible plan of salvation to come and rescue us out of our transgressions and sins. God, I pray today that as you've stirred in our hearts through this study of these three verses, that you would grant us the Holy Spirit of conviction to point to us, God, if there's any sinful way within us that we have not dealt with, if there's anything in our attitudes or in our actions, our our inner being, please speak to us about that, God, that we might repent of it, that we might find grace and forgiveness in the shed blood of Jesus, and that we might again walk in the joy of our salvation before you, the God who loves us so. So, God, I pray you protect us during this unusual time of uh, isolation uh, from our church family, our Ephesians family, and in the world. God, we pray your mercy upon the world and upon those who, God, are living in fear and isolation. They don't know you. They don't know there is good news. They don't know there is rescue. God, may we be shining lights in this dark world during this time. So, again, bless us. Help us, God, to use our time profitably for the sake of the kingdom. 
And when we come together again next time to study the next part of the text, oh God, fill us with fresh and new faith. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen.